We enter our study in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13 discussing this particular verse, but we didn't finish with all the questions we have concerning this verse. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13 states, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. This is Paul's personal testimony about the marvelous grace of God that we sang about a moment ago and uh, his gratitude for God's grace and God's mercy that have enabled him to be the person he now is active in the service of the Lord as one of his apostles. <clears throat> I think we're ready for question number 14, am I right? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what does the New Testament teach concerning sins of ignorance? Uh, the sins of ignorance here probably is a reference to sins of omission. Uh, there, we categorize sins variously, sometimes into two main categories, sins of commission and sins of omission. Sins of commission are what we do that we know we shouldn't do. And that's often what we think of when we think of sin. But the sins of omission are things that we ought to do that we didn't do. And sometimes we don't do things because we didn't know we were supposed to. We had not been properly instructed. Now in this verse, when Paul indicates that he had ignorantly uh, been the kind of a person he was, uh, is a case of where nobody had informed him. Or he had not paid attention to those who could inform him because he was so sure that he was right, he knew his Old Testament very well. He didn't understand the spirit of it, he didn't understand the prophecies it contained, but he certainly understood the legal aspect of it. He describes himself in other writings as a Pharisee of the Pharisees, probably meaning that he had done more memory work of the Old Testament law than anybody else around him. Well, there are some things that we need to know. Sin is sin, whether it is sins that we commit or sins of things that we should have done that we omit, we didn't do. The fact remains, however, that uh, anybody that sins must repent to receive the forgiveness of sins. Now, will a person be forgiven if they acted ignorantly in unbelief? I think the classic answer and the correct answer to forgiveness and sin is the fact that any sin that can and is repented of will be forgiven. You remember the prayer that Jesus prayed on the cross? Father, forgive them. What's the rest of that? They don't realize what they're doing. They should have known, but they didn't. So they, there's a case of acting ignorantly and unbelief. Yet the evidence was there before them. They had to make up lies against him. People believed the lies. People were swayed by the thinking of their religious leaders. And they're the ones that are behind all of this mob action to have Christ crucified. Now, was ignorance the cause or the circumstance for Paul's forgiveness? It was not both, I don't think. I don't think it was the cause. I think it was the circumstance. In other words, it's not because he acted in unbelief. It's because of circumstances under which he acted in unbelief that he is forgiven. Is there anything in the Old Testament that suggests the difference between that which is done ignorantly and that which is done with a high hand? And I've given you the reference there in your notes in the 15th chapter of the book of Numbers, verses 27 through 31. It begins with these words. If one person sins unintentionally, then he shall offer one year old female goat for a sin offering. And he goes on in to make further explanations of what's to be done. So here he's talking about a person that did something they didn't intend to, but they did. And now that they realize that they've done something they should not have done, there is a way for them to receive forgiveness. Now, the Old Testament does not offer forgiveness to anybody 
who does sin willfully. That's with a high hand. Uh, there just was no arrangements made for them to have forgiveness. In reality, forgiveness was not fully realized under the old covenant until what event took place? The death of Christ. He was the sin offering. He who knew no sin became sin for us, that through him our sins might be forgiven because he's a perfect sacrifice for God. Now, what does Paul's strenuous attempt to please God by law keeping apart from the gospel cause him to do? Well, according to this verse, he's a blasphemer, he's a persecutor, he's a violent aggressor. All because he's trying to do what he thinks the law would have him to do. He really thinks that he's pleasing God. But he's wrong. And I wonder how many people there are today that really deep down in their heart believe they're doing exactly what God wants them to do, but they're misinformed. And these people need to understand the clear teaching of God's word. How was God's mercy shown to Paul? Well, the way that it's shown originally is through forgiveness. It's also shown in a greater degree with Paul in the fact that he was called to be an apostle. Now, I think the thing that is to be understood in that is the fact that God can use anybody that is surrendered to his will. But there are some people that God can use in a very special way because they are a very special person. And one thing we know about the Apostle Paul before he ever became a Christian, did he have leadership ability? Did he have stamina? Did he have courage? Did he have dedication to what he believed was right? Yes, he did. Now, if he can take that same energy and that same enthusiasm and that same devotion uh, and channel it in the right direction, this can be a powerful force. And the study of the great Apostle Paul in the Scripture is really a challenging story for every one of us. A great man that paid a great price to serve God as an apostle. Now, in what way did Paul, prior to becoming a Christian, act ignorantly? Persecuted. That's right. And he thought that was right. But he was wrong. Now, verse 14 states, And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. Now in what way did Paul see himself as an object of God's grace? And I cite you this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, which simply says, as Paul is testifying, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now how did God's grace compare with Paul's sin? Obviously it was greater. And that's what we sang about a while ago, a while ago. Grace that is greater than all our sin. And I think that the writer of that hymn probably had such scriptures as we're studying tonight in mind, as well as other scriptures that speak about the marvelous grace of God. What God does that we don't deserve, but out of His abundant love, does what we need to have done for us. Now apparently Paul did not try to forget his sinful past. He makes reference to it again and again in his writings. Why does he rehearse his past sins? Every time he brings up his past sins, what does this remind him of? God's grace. That's exactly right. And he never wants to forget what God has done for him, realizing that what God has done for him, he can do for others also. Now, Paul delighted in using superlatives. A superlative is an exaggeration. He loves to really emphasize something in a strong way, especially when describing the grace of God. So how does he describe God's grace in verse 14? More than abundant. More than abundant. In other words, far more than was anticipated, far more than was needed, far more than was expected, but it's so abundant that he just has to say it was more than abundant. Now, what was Paul missing before he began to experience the abundance of God's grace? That which came along with the grace of God, according to this verse, were faith and love. Now, the word faith 
is used several different ways in Scripture. Sometimes it talks about our personal faith. I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think he's talking about the body of doctrine that we believe. The Christian faith. As opposed to other religions in the world. But here he's indicating that as a result of God's grace, now he's a part of those people who have a faith in God. That faith is based upon what God through Christ has done for us. So I think he's speaking here of what he believes, what all Christians believe that set them apart from the rest of the world. Now, what is the relationship of faith and love with grace? Faith and love give evidence of the fact that we've experienced the grace of God. Those who have a strong faith in God, particularly those who have come out of a rough background and now are fully de uh, dedicated to the Lord, that shows how powerful God's grace is. That can change a life so dramatically. And some people have a, a greater visibility of a wonderful change than other people do. Uh, this is not to say that one group of people is better than another group of people. I, throughout my life, have listened to people talk about the dramatic change that took place in their life. And for a long time, that really bothered me because I cannot say that. I never went through a dramatic change in my life. I was born into a Christian home. I was reared in the church. Uh, you know, I just ate and slept the Bible and Christianity and the church. And it was my whole life. When I became a Christian, it happened because I reached the age of understanding that when I knew the difference between right and wrong, I was responsible for making a decision for what was right. So I chose to make that. But I've been doing that all along because that's the way I was reared. That's the way I was taught. So, you know, people may say, well, I never did see much of a change in this life. Well, that can be a real compliment if we were reared in a Christian faith and we remain true to that which we were taught even in our early childhood. But in the case of Paul and others like him, there is a very obvious change that's taken place by the grace of God. Now, does Paul speak of faith and love as the condition or the result of his justification? It's the result, right. It's not the cause, it's not the condition, but it's the result. This is the evidence of the fact that God's grace has forgiven him of all of his sins. Now, in verse 15, we come to our first what is called a trustworthy statement. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. Now, how many times is the phrase a trustworthy statement found in the pastorals? By the way, when I talk about the pastorals, what three Bible books am I talking about? That's right, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. So in 1st Timothy, a trustworthy statement we're going to read three different times. In 2nd Timothy, we'll read it one time. In Titus, we'll read it one time. So in these three epistles, we're going to see five what are designated as a trustworthy statement. That phrase is not used anywhere else in the scriptures to my knowledge. So, how many times is the phrase of trustworthy statement found in the rest of the New Testament? Five. Well, five in the epistles, the three epistles. But how many in the rest of it? You said none. None. And you believe me? I believe you. Good. All right. I just want to make sure you're listening. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not found anywhere else in the New Testament, that particular phrase, but it is in the pastorals. Now, what is suggested with the phrase a trustworthy statement? If somebody makes what they call a trustworthy statement, what, what can you do with it? Believe it? You can believe it. Stake your life on it. Count on it being for sure, with no doubt involved at all. Now, what is Paul contrasting with the phrase, a trustworthy statement? What would be classified as an untrustworthy statement? A lie. A lie, that's right. False doctrine. People are saying things that are not according to what God teaches us. Is there any language in the Old Testament similar to the phrase, a trustworthy statement? Yes, there is. Uh, back in the Old Testament book of Psalm 19, he says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. That would be like saying, this is trustworthy. The testimony of the Lord is 
Sure, you can count on it. And in Psalm 93 and verse 5, thy testimonies are fully confirmed, completely established, adequately verified. Count on it. Now, what is the statement that is trustworthy that he gives us in this particular verse? Came to save sinners. That's right. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's a thing that you can count on. That's what he came for. When Jesus was a guest and inviting himself to be a guest in the home of Zacchaeus, he told him on that occasion, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. And this is what his whole life is about. So what words did Jesus express that resembles this statement? The one I just quoted to you from Luke chapter 19, verse 10. That was a statement he made to Zacchaeus. Was Paul still a sinner at the time he wrote these words? Says he is, doesn't he? Says, I am. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am. He didn't say I was. I am. Now, these three letters, 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, are among the last books that Paul wrote. So he's an older man now. He's already written several New Testament letters. He's already established several churches, been on several missionary tours, and now he's saying, I am the foremost of sinners. Now, Paul was still a sinner but he was a forgiven sinner. Now, how many of us does that describe? All of us. All of us, that's right. We are sinners, but we are forgiven sinners. And the marvelous thing about the forgiveness that we have is that not only did we receive a total cleansing at the time of our conversion, so that when he came up out of the waters of baptism, as Romans chapter 6 and the first several verses tell us, we rose to walk in newness of life. Our sins were washed away by the blood of Jesus Christ. We shared with Christ in His death and His burial in the act of our baptism. However, do we sin since we become Christians? I wish we didn't. But all of us do from time to time, in one way or another. Now the joy of such a fellowship as we have here tonight is expressed there in 1 John. If we walk in the light as He is in the light and have fellowship with one another, the blood of Christ does what? Continuously. Continuously cleanses us from all our sin. That's going on without our even awareness of the fact. We know it to be true. We've just reminded ourselves of it. But it just automatically happens by our fellowship with each other in the Word, in encouraging one another, in walking in the light. Now, what is the significance of Paul saying, I am, rather than I was? I think he wants to underscore the fact, I am saved right now because I know what God right now is doing for me because right now I am not as good as I ought to be. Nobody's perfect. And Paul recognized that. And he's underscoring what John really emphasizes in 1 John chapter 1, where he says, if we say we have no sin, we do what? Lie. Lie. We don't tell the truth. And as Paul wrote in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And sometimes we look upon ourselves almost as if, well, I don't sin. Well, we do, unfortunately. And I think the sins that we may be most guilty of might be the sins of omission. Not that we're, at, we're not out robbing a bank or committing murder or telling a bunch of lies. But there are a lot of things maybe we ought to be doing that we're just not doing as much as we ought to. You know, consider our devotional life. How much of our time is spent thinking about God and His Word and doing His will? Um, now, what would cause Paul to see himself foremost of all sinners? You know, I thought a lot about this. Uh, it's interesting to me to look at an object through a magnifying glass. 
Do you see some things through a magnifying glass you don't see otherwise? Yeah. <clears throat> you surely do. And the smaller the object, the more important the magnifying glass becomes. Is there anything that you see in God's sunlight in the brightness of the sun at noontime that you don't see in the dim light inside of a building at night? Yeah, there is. The greater the light, the more apt you are to see the imperfections. The things that are there all the time, but you just didn't notice them. Now, I think that Paul refers to himself as the foremost of sinners because he's constantly living with an awareness of God's presence in his own life. Now, what can be said about everything that Paul has written that's now in the Bible? Where did it come from? Inspired. That's right. The Holy Spirit is giving this message to him. And as he's receiving all this message, as he's preaching it, as he's writing it down, he is living with an awareness of God's presence and realizing, you know, I need this as much as anybody else does. I, I wish that sometimes people could have some of the experiences that preachers have. I, I, uh, I'm working on a sermon almost every day. I may never preach them. I just enjoy doing it. And uh, I'm my own audience. I finished a sermon today that's 10 pages long, single space type written, and that's about average for me. And it covers only 14 verses in the Bible, but all the way through that, it took me about two weeks to get through it, just to cover those 14 verses. But uh, man, those verses spoke volumes to me. And I, you know, I think, okay, who's talking to me? And what was the background for saying that? And I think, how's that apply to me? And all the way through. In fact, uh, I mentioned before class got started tonight, uh, a lot of times when I'm studying God's Word, songs of the past will come to my mind. And one of them recently came to my mind is the one we sang tonight, Grace That Is Greater Than All of Our Sin. One of the reasons that came to my mind is because I'd been studying again for this lesson tonight, realized how important grace was to Paul, it's important to all the rest of us too, and sometimes we just kind of take it for granted. Well, the closer we live to God, the more apt we are to feel our own shortcomings. <coughs> I don't remember who made this statement, but it's a statement that I'll probably never forget. This one fellow, and this happened a long time ago, this one fellow said to the other fellow, I don't like you. Because every time I see you, you make me see myself. And I don't like what I see when I see myself. What was he saying? Obviously, this friend of his lived such an exemplary life. It made him look like, man, I'm, I'm a nobody in comparison with you. And I don't like to think of myself that way. I think that's a kind of the way that Paul's feeling here. I think that's what he's expressing. He lives in the presence of God and the God's holiness, and he sees himself in that light. Now, why is Paul calling attention to his own sin? Why do you think he wants people to know this? He can get grace anybody can. That's exactly right. I think that's the main point that he's making. Listen, I want you to know the kind of person I was and I am and what kind of a God I serve. And even now, I'm experiencing the grace the mercy and the patience of God. Now, what is Paul's magnifying? What is Paul magnifying by calling attention to his own sinfulness? What's the counterpart to this? God's grace. And as great as his sinfulness is, he wants them to see how terrible it really is. To realize how great God's grace really is. Now, in what other letter did Paul express himself in a similar way? Well, I've made reference to this a while ago. In the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the great resurrect, resurrection chapter of the Bible, he said, I am the least of the apostles. I'm not fit to be called an apostle. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, even though I had persecuted the church. But by the way, what does the word foremost mean? Front of the line. Front of the line, that's right. He's the worst. He's the first. He's right out there in front. Verse 16. 
Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now, what did the magnitude of sin make necessary on God's part? The ultimate sacrifice? Yeah. Yes, and the ultimate sacrifice was made possible because God is what kind of a God? A loving God. And according to this verse, He's a... Merciful. Merciful. That's the word I'm looking for. Now, tell me once again, is there any difference between grace and mercy? Yes. Many times they're used interchangeably, but there is a fine line of distinction. I'll give you the definition. You tell me which word I'm describing. This word talks about what God doesn't do to me that I do deserve. Mercy. That's mercy. By the way, how many of us need that? All of us. <laughs> well, the hands went up in a hurry there. Now, what's this word? He gave me so much more that I could have ever wanted or deserved. Grace. That's grace. They really do go together, but there is a distinction between the two. Now for this reason, suggest purpose. What was Paul's purpose of uh, God's mercy and God's grace? Why is God doing this for Paul? Example. Example, that's exactly right. And through this example, he wants others to experience what he is now experiencing or has recently experienced. In other words, he wants others to know what it means to be saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's experienced that. He wants others to experience that too. Now, since Paul was the worst of sinners, how does this account for his conversion? God's grace. God's grace and God's mercy. And there's a third word he adds here. What was God being with him? Patient. Patient. He certainly was. Very patient. How do we know that Paul expected his own conversion to have a positive effect upon others? Is it different? Yeah, he indicates it here. This is an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. So he views himself as an example of what God can do. Now, how does Paul explain Christ's mercy in this verse? Back of God's mercy is his long suffering. Long suffering is another way of expressing what word? Patience. Patience. God is patient. In fact, I believe that's the only reason God has not already sent his son for his church. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He is long suffering, he is patient. Should each of us try to be an example to others of what God's grace and mercy can accomplish in one's life? Yes. I think so. Now, the meaning of the word example is a pattern or role model. And Paul is saying, yeah, look at me. And if you don't know about my past, let me tell you about my past. And then I want you to visualize the kind of a fellow I once was and what I once did and the kind of a person I am now and what I am now doing. And all this is a result of God having His way in my life. And I'm so grateful for it. And what He's done for me, He can do for you too. So Paul views himself as a pattern, as an example, as a role model for others. How many times does Paul's conversion appear in the New Testament? Anybody know? In the New Testament? Yes. His, con his actual conversion? His actual conversion. In the ninth chapter of Acts, that's the first time. He makes reference to it in Galatians. Yes, you're exactly right. Doesn't go through the whole process there. He goes through the entire process of what happened three times in the book of Acts. In fact, the book of Acts is the history book. So that's where you'd expect to find examples of how God has worked in the lives of people. But once in chapter 9, once in chapter 22, and the last time before King Agrippa in chapter 26. Now, I skipped over chapter 22. I don't want to do that. Anybody know the setting in which he related his conversion experience in chapter 22? 
This is after Paul had come back from his third missionary tour. And he came to Jerusalem, and uh, a lie was told about him. They had seen him in the temple, and they had also seen him with a man by the name of Trophimus. By the way, Trophimus was a Gentile. Paul met Trophimus on his missionary tours. Trophimus was a Christian Gentile. But they had seen the two of them together. They had also seen Paul in the temple helping to pay the expenses of a couple others that were completing their vow. And this was Paul following some counsel that had been given by his friends there in Jerusalem when he returned. They said, Paul, uh, really, your life's kind of in danger. A lot of people don't like you. They're out to get you. And we think one of the best ways for you to keep safe is for you to go to the temple with these others who are completing a vow, probably the Nazarite vow, and they'll realize that uh, everything that's been said about you is not true. You are not a hater of the law. Obviously, Paul no longer lived under the law, but he's trying to be expedient here. In fact, what did Paul do for Timothy as a matter of expediency that was not necessary at all? Circumcised. That's right. And why did he circumcise Timothy? Just to stop grumbling, probably. That's right. Timothy's father was a Greek. And Timothy's going to be working with Paul. And when they're working together, are they ever going to be in a synagogue? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are. Now, Paul's primary ministry was to the Gentiles, but they're going to be facing both Jews and Gentiles. He didn't want anybody to come up and say, well, Timothy, why should we listen to you? You've never even been circumcised. Oh, yes, I have. Not because he had to be, but because it was an expediency. It's a part of Paul's program of saying, I become all things to all men, in order that by all means I might win some. Now, so, was it he didn't do that for? Was it Titus? Titus he didn't do that for. And when he didn't circumcise Titus, is because they were discussing the very issue. Is circumcision necessary for salvation? And Paul said, no, it is not. And he had with him his friend Titus. And he said, here is a genuine Christian, and he's not been circumcised, he's not going to be, there's no need for it. And so, Paul is demonstrating that he's willing to be expedient, but he's not going to cave in and do something to make people think he believes something he doesn't believe. So a lot of times, we will adjust to certain things that are neither right nor wrong, just a matter of custom or habit. We want to fit in. We want to be able to have an audience with them, you know. And so we adjust accordingly. And that's what Paul has done. Well, on this occasion in chapter 22, Paul had come back from his third missionary journey, and the people were uh, out to get him. So some of the Jews saw him coming out of the temple. Now they waited until he was clear outside. And there were a crowd of people around and said, There he is! He's the man that took a Gentile into the temple. Come on, let's get him! And immediately they excited a riot. And they were about to tear him limb from limb. And what kept them from doing it? The Roman guard was there. And they saw what was going on. And the reason that they had the Roman guard there is because they knew that anytime there's a special gathering in Jerusalem of the Jews, we better have some military force there because these people can very quickly create a real scene, a real riot, and a lot of damage can be done. We want to make sure everything's under control. So they went out and rescued him. And when they pulled him away from the crowd and are taking him up into the barracks, Paul said, please, sir, May I have an opportunity to say a word to these people? And when they heard him talk, said, Oh, you talk their language. Yeah, I do. Remember, he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He not only spoke Greek, he spoke Aramaic, he spoke Hebrew. So he's speaking their language. And they said, Yeah, go on and have at it. So he said, Men of Israel, I want you to know who I am. And many of you out there watching me right now, know the kind of a life I once lived. Let me tell you what happened. I had gained permission. I was on my way to Damascus. I was going to further persecute the church. And along the way, 
the Lord appeared to me. Blinded my eyes. I had to be led into the city. And I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I'll send you a man. He'll tell you what to do. I waited three days. I was fasting. I was praying. And a preacher by the name of Ananias came to me. And he told me how to become a Christian. And help me to understand the Word of God correctly. He said, I want you to know that. So he's sharing that with these people. Those very people that wanted to destroy him said, Listen, the reason that I am who I am is because I have seen the Messiah. I want you to see him too. I want you to know him like I know him. I want you to be the kind of person I am. I want you to have your sins forgiven. But they had made up their minds, and so he didn't gain much except for the fact that they did hear him. They learned what had happened to him. So when they stand before God in the day of judgment, they can't say, well, how, were we, how were we to know this? <laughs> well, here's a man that they all knew. They just didn't like what they knew about him now. They didn't like the fact that they see themselves not as good as he is. They don't want to admit that, obviously. Anyhow, three times, 9, 22, and 26 chapters of the book of Acts, he relates his conversion experience. How did Paul find mercy? He found mercy through the vision that he saw of the Lord himself. And why was it important that he see the Lord himself? So he could be impossible. So he could be an apostle. That was a requirement. Had to be an eyewitness of the resurrected Lord. And then, of course, the visit of Ananias was God showing mercy and giving him an understanding of what he needs to know in order to become a Christian. Now, why is God patient with men? He wants us to all be saved. That's exactly right. He wants every one of us to be saved. Now, he talks about eternal life. What is eternal life? That's exactly right. I'm glad you said it that way. Because for some people, he said life with God. Not only with, but like God. Life like God, like with God. Sometimes we think of eternal life as life that just doesn't have any end. Well, of course, that's true. But as the word used, is used in the Scripture, there is a qualitative as well as a quantitative meaning to the word eternal. Let me read to you uh, what... John 17, 3 says, you've got this in your notes. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So eternal life is to know God, to know Christ, intimately, personally. And so it's a life with God, like God, walking in the steps of Christ. Now when do we receive eternal life? That's right, at our baptism, at the time we become Christians. Remember in John chapter 5 and verse 24, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Now, by the way, when people pick out a scripture like this, it's very easy to say, see, here's a scripture that backs up what I believe. All you have to do is believe. That's what this verse says. I think, wait a minute. What does this verse say in light of every other verse in the New Testament that explains to us what it means to believe? Well, James very clearly says, faith alone without works is dead. Are you saying we're saved with a dead faith? That there's nothing to be done? Jesus said, you have to be born again. Of the water and the spirit. Does water mean water? Yes, it does. Yeah. If water doesn't mean water, then spirit cannot mean spirit. Yeah. Because the conjunction and unites those two words together. Yeah. And if the word spirit is literal, the word water has to be literal. And it makes sense. And there's not a single record in the book of Acts, the history book, that speaks of people being converted apart from mentioning the fact that they've been baptized. Now listen to me carefully. Not every record states that they confessed. Not every record states that they repented. 
Not every record states that they believed, but every record states they were baptized. Now, were they, did they all believe? Sure. Did they all repent? Sure. Did they all confess? Sure. The rest of the scriptures make this very clear. So we had to, you know, when a student comes to, to me when I was teaching at the college, how am I going to answer a person like that? I said, well, why don't you just use a simple illustration? Ask the person who brings that up to you. Do you reckon you've got to eat to live? Listen for their answer. Well, yeah, you do. Anybody knows that. Good. Let's quit breathing. What do you mean? All you have to do is eat to live. Don't have to breathe. So let's just plug up. <laughs> That's stupid. No more stupid than the kind of reasoning that people use when they're trying to get around the plain truths of God's Word. Is it true to say you've got to eat to live? Sure it is. But it's equally true to say you've got to breathe to live too. You're mighty nice to put up with my foolishness. But I think, you know, sometimes things are just so simple and people just don't reason carefully enough to see the, all the word coming together. But when we become a Christian, we pass out of death into life, he says. This is in John chapter 5 and verse 24. Now listen to the other passage in 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. I like that. It's a matter of knowing. It's not a matter of thinking. Not a matter of hoping. It's a matter of knowing. Upon the fact that we've obeyed the gospel, We've done what the Lord tells us we need to do to be saved. We have received eternal life. Now, have we fully realized the fullness of eternal life? Obviously not. Day by day, we're becoming more like Him. And we'll not be fully like Him until He comes again. And when He comes again, what are we going to be like? Don't know for sure, but I do know we're going to be like Him. Because the Scriptures make that clear. Well, if we're going to be like Jesus, that's good enough for me. Now, who are those who would believe in Him? I think he's talking about those who would respond to the Gospel, surrender their lives completely to the Lord Jesus Christ, and make Him the Master of their lives as well as their Savior. <coughs> now, verse 17 says, Now to the King, Im eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. What one word is a proper word to describe that verse? Doxology. Doxology simply means a word of praise, a word of honor, a good word. There are two doxologies in 1 Timothy. This one, and we're going to see another one in chapter 6 and verses 15 and 16. So the word of doxology is a word of glory. Now, what is the meaning of king eternal? If he's king eternal, how long has he been king? All the time. King of the ages is another way of talking about this. He's always been on his throne. Never vacated the throne. Never will. What does the fact that God is king suggest? If he's a king, then there must be a what? A kingdom. A kingdom. Yeah. There's got to be something which he's king over. So he's a king and the people of his are his kingdom. Now, what's the meaning of immortal? Sometimes people have mistaken that for saying, well, that means you're going to live forever. Well, yeah, but that's not the technical meaning of the word. The word immortal means not going to decay, not going to rot away, not going to perish, not going to be corrupted. So he's immortal. Nothing changes him. He stays the pure and mighty, mighty God that he is. Now, why does Paul refer to God as invisible? He is, that's right. God is spirit. And those who worship him, worship him in spirit and truth. What is, Paul's emphasize, what, what is Paul emphasizing with the expression, the only God? Yes, he's aware of the fact that the Greek world believes there are many gods. The Jewish world recognizes there's only one God. 
In this respect, the Jews are right. And he's acknowledging that. And those who think there are many gods are wrong. Now, how does one honor God? Okay. That's right. And to respect, isn't it? Uh, to appreciation. Uh, the word glory is a... What's another word for glory? You glorify somebody, what do you do? Praise, Praise them. Compliment. You compliment them. That's right. You recognize them for who they really are. You adore them. Now, what's the meaning of the word amen? That's, so be it. That's right. It means it's true. Now, this command I entrust to you, this is verse 18, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight. In what sense may Paul be saying to Timothy that he should be true to his name? Now, you know how to spell the word Timothy. The first three letters would be his nickname. What's that? Yeah. Put an E on that word. That's a word, that's a Greek word for honor. T-I-M-E is a Greek word for honor. Now, the last three words of Timothy are what? T-H-Y. That's God. Theos. So, his name means honor God. I think Paul is saying, Timothy, live up to your name. Honor God. Praise God. Now, what do we understand by the expression, my son? This is Paul's way of saying, man, we're as close as we can be. We're not biologically related, but in the Lord, we're just like father and son. I think he's seeing his youthfulness and recognizing his age in comparison. I think it's a term of endearment. This command that Paul's entrusted to Timothy is a command that we've talked about back in verses 3 and 5 to maintain sound doctrine, to stand up against the false teachings of that day. Make sure that people understand the truth. Now in what sense did Paul entrust this command to Timothy? I think it's like, uh, here's an old person, they realize my days are numbered, I need somebody to step in and take my place, and so they pass the torch. I think a classic example of this, and I say this to their credit, one of the largest Christian churches in the United States is up there in Kentucky. Thousands of people assemble every Lord's Day. And the preacher who was there to experience all this tremendous growth realized the day would soon come. Maybe not as soon as he anticipated, maybe sooner. He didn't know. But he knew with a congregation this size, I need to get somebody ready to take over. So he made sure that they selected a couple of men that were just outstanding men. And one by one, the first one came in and, and uh, the preacher said to him, said, now, I want you to preach a few times this first year. Next year, you're going to preach more. And said, you need to know uh, that you're going to be compared. And uh, don't worry about that. It's just the way people are. They're going to compare us. Always people are going to have their favorites. And he said, particularly if you're in the restroom and you're in a stall, you may hear a couple of men talking. Wonder who's preaching today? This guy. Oh, no, not him. If I'd known that, I wouldn't have come. He said, you're going to hear that. Don't let it bother you. It's just the way people are. And the fellow that was the first one brought in is the one that told me, told me about all this. He said, yeah, he was right. But he said, in time, people began to like the new one brought in better than the old one they already had, you know. And they brought another one in. So now, he's out. And somebody's taking his place. I think that's what Paul's doing. Paul's saying, Timothy, somebody's got to carry this on. You're a good man. We're working together. But one of these days, you're not going to have me, so be prepared now. That's why I think his last letters are addressed to two men that he's counting on you guys are going to have to carry it on. Timothy and Titus. The prophecies, I think, refer to the Word of God. And we've run out of time, so we'll start at that point when we resume our study again next week. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for...
this privilege to share together in this wonderful fellowship of study. Obviously, when we're in your word, we're not out doing things we ought not to do. And at least our attention is being focused upon things that you want us to be focused upon. So we're learning a little bit at a time. I forget so easily I need to be reminded again and again. I thank you for the privilege of sharing with these people. I thank you for these people that are willing to have me share with them. But I thank you most of all for your grace and your mercy and for the joy of being a part of your family. In Christ's name. Thank you.